I think consciousness is the ultimate mystery and the ultimate challenge, not just to neuroscience, but to philosophers, or indeed to anyone. I mean, if you just think about it for a moment, what is going on right now inside your head, inside my head, that gives you this perspective on the world? There's no little man or little woman in there. And even if I said, guess what, Rachel, I've now realized how the brain generates consciousness, what would you expect me to show you? What would it be? Would it be a performing rat or a formula or a, a brain scan? We have no idea even what kind of answer, what kind of answer, even the most hypothetical, would satisfy this riddle, and that's what it is. So um, stepping back from that and admitting that as yet how the water, if you like, gets turned into wine, you know, the water of everyday bump and grinder brain cells gets converted into the wine of subjective experience. Mm. Leaving that aside mm. and fully fessing up, you know, I wave the white flag, um, I have no idea how we would answer that question. Yeah. I think neuroscience can make a contribution, along with philosophy and maths and so on, uh, by looking at what we call correlations. Mm. That's to say how certain things that go on in the brain match up with things that you might be feeling. Yeah. Your area of research uh, that you talk about in your book really looks at Alzheimer's disease, dementia, at the point where you know, thinking and cognitive abilities really have started to become impaired and you can really notice a change. And where neurodegeneration really has started to take hold and consciousness really does change at that, that point in life. The, the area that I'm really interested in um, and the area that I work in at the School of Psychological Sciences and in the ABLE study of aging at the Flory here is looking at very, very early stages. We, we're really interested in preclinical detection when people are actually cognitively very normal and you really can't tell that there's any memory impairment at all. And the one thing that we're very interested in is this notion of the subjective experience of forgetfulness. You are feeling like you're forgetting things and you're becoming concerned about it. And that's the point when you go to the doctor and you say, look, I'm very worried about my memory, I've noticed something changing. It's this conscious awareness that something's changing in your cognition. How would you say that that would relate to some of the theories you've been talking about in your book? What you're alluding to is a lack of insight or, a fav or, 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 or yeah. an awareness. Mm. So a change in the self-conscious. But of course, as you'll know, as the patient progresses, they lose that sadly Absolutely. and they become like a small child, like an infant again. Absolutely. Interestingly enough, talking about people in the very early stages, mm. I'm sure you heard the study, it was in all the news, perhaps it was your own study, I don't know, showing that one of the earliest signs is a change in sense of humour. Did you hear this? Yes, I did. Where laughing at a funeral I or... I did. You know, of course, in frontotemporal dementia, I Yeah, yes, that's right. And the English made a huge thing on this about you know, losing your sense of humour yes. or it's no laughing matter, mm. which of course it's not. But mm. I feel that rather interesting also because, yes. again, it's showing very subtly yeah. something that's inappropriate. Now, it's not as if you've simply lost your memory or can't remember why you went to London. Or, you know, it's something that's extremely subtle, which mm. a person might be aware of. And now where do you think you'll be going with your research? Um, I think there's three areas, really. Mm. That, um, one is something that I find very interesting that I just sort of came into quite late is the impact of technology on kids' brains and the impact on education mm. and what we want of the next generation. And that's really self-interest because given that we're going to get old in this century and the kids born now are going to be looking after us mm. you know i'd like them to be not glassy-eyed zombies you know playing video games but kind of compassionate human beings mm. be helpful so that's my own selfish thought um on a deeper level i would like to really make an advance in the treatment of alzheimer's mm. uh, because as you know there's been no drug for the last 10 or 15 yes, years right. and so i would like to have a drug not a magic cure mm. but one that stopped the cells dying one that was an effective treatment. Mm. So that would be an amazing gift to leave to society. Absolutely. And then on a, a more sort of highfalutin, if, if that's possible, level, I'd like to think in my obituary that someone said she made an important contribution to our understanding of consciousness. Mm. You know, I don't want to say, oh, she solved it. But I think if one can say you've made a contribution that other people found helpful, mm. that would be really worthwhile. I absolutely agree mm. with you. And I think one of the most important things that you've done with you know, this book coming out mm. is you've posited a theory and a hypothesis yeah. and now it's up to, you know, the next generation or yourself, your pick lab, yeah. to pick it up and run with it and, sure. and test it, Indeed. you know, and I think um, that is one of the most fun and exciting parts of science. That is the only reason to do <laughs> science. Anyone watching, it's not to get rich, just no, in case anyone no, thinks they're going to make a lot of money. No, exactly. <laughs>